Oh, thank you. Yep. Okay, so is that loud enough? Um, so we, we thought format today, so I've come and, and done this a few times uh, um, when it's held me up in the room upstairs as well as I've done a few down here. Um, this format, we wanted to change it up a little bit and instead of having it be more of a monologue, we'd like to have it as interactive as possible. So instead of just having a monologue and then Q&A at the end, we'd like to be able to have um, everyone in the room feel very free to interrupt. Just raise your hand at any minute that we're just talking and ask a question about anything that we're talking about. So we have a talk track and some slides to go through to give a little bit of background on MX and the general entrepreneurship uh, um, kind of path. Um, Don, from, from our conversations that we've had of my background, put together some, uh, a little bit of slides that talk about my background when I was much younger that I think may be interesting maybe to, to some people here. Um, and then uh, get into a little bit about MX and, and perspectives from a large company and then uh, perspectives from uh, what it's like on the startup side and what it's like on the, the large uh, corporate side as well. So um, with that, I'll kind of hand a little bit over to you, Don, to kind of click okay. through some of this. What we did was we actually took a lot of the inputs we received as to what would be interesting to understand what makes an entrepreneur, what drives an entrepreneur, etc. And so these are, as Ryan mentioned, these are some background slides. But the very first thing was influences in people's lives. What drives you to be an entrepreneur? What influences you? And I know that family... is much more important than having a click thing that works. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind just pressing the advance or just space bar. Thank you. So this was actually taken from our Halloween party at MX yesterday, but I'll hand it over to you, Ryan. In terms of um, influences on your life, what's really important to you, aside from uh, obviously driving the business, which we'll talk about in a second? Yeah, I think this is relevant to, to BYU. So um, obviously, I adore our little monster. She just hit, uh, just past 10 months old. Um, and so uh, I modified one of my racing uh, suits uh, to be a monster catching suit. So I was a monster catcher for Halloween. Um, but uh, f family, community, all that's really critical to not just myself, but the entire MX family. And, and I know Don feels really strongly about this as well. We've um, uh, put a huge focus on trying to create the best uh, work-life balance that we can. As an entrepreneur, you have to drive hard. Like, you, you're working some pretty crazy hours. Um, and uh, Steve knows entrepreneurial stuff that I did when I was uh, attending uh, the Marriott School. And um, I worked some, some pretty crazy hours. I wasn't married back then. Um, but now we, we try to do a lot. Like, we, have, we cater in lunches a few times a week, and we cater in uh, all the dinners. And we invite families um, and the kids and, and uh, spouses and sometimes even parents to come in and, and kind of hang out. Um, uh, for those lunches or for different times and events that we throw to try to be able to have that, that, that feeling of community. And then from a company standpoint, we'll get into it in a, in a bit, but um, a huge amount of what we're doing mission-wise is, is trying to affect, trying to have a positive impact on what we think is one of the most critical, fundamental drivers of growth and happiness and all those types of things, which is finances. If you don't have, if your finances are a complete wreck and you have no financial capacity, it's like a hierarchy of needs. Um, you've got to have good health, you've got to have basic finances or, or, or your life's a wreck. And so we're trying to help enable that. And you were talking when we spoke um, earlier, goodness grief. Is it still not? Yeah, there it goes, obviously operator error. Um, you know, many of the students here have got Core i7 CPUs um, from the good people at Intel, but you actually started programming on... Um, well, first, does, does anyone know what that is? Yeah, you do, yeah. Does anyone else know what that is? Has anyone heard of Intel or...? You do? What is it? No, 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 this. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. It, it's a Commodore, do you know which, which, which one it is? It's Commodore 64. So, yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, the, the idea being in terms of your, your, I think what we were trying to share with the uh, audience here was rather you're at home with your family, a number of um, siblings, et cetera, but you start getting into computer and technology with a Commodore 64. So where does that take you? Yeah, I think, uh, so I, I was very fortunate, um, as with everything in life, a lot of things are mixed with, um, I feel like, hard work and then good fortune. Um, and my parents, for whatever reason, ended up buying a Commodore 64. Both of my parents really having no idea how to use it or what to do with it beyond maybe very basic even word processing, but I don't know that they really even used it for that. Um, it was more of just kind of a cool thing to have. And for us, financially, it was a big stretch because I did not come from a well-off family by any means. And so um, 
when we got this thing, it came with a bunch of manuals that just sat there and probably would have never been opened, but one of them was uh, involving Commodore Basic. And so um, you could flip through this, this manual. This was way before there was internet or any ability to search for anything online. So you had to get most of this knowledge through books or through another human telling you. And um, taught myself how to code um, and wrote my first computer games um, and uh, things like that around 12-ish years old. And so had a huge love for technology at an early age. And I think that's important I mean, critical. This is before Intel was like, you know, killing it. <laughs> But then you took a track with the um, Air Force. So how did technology in the Air Force influence your life? So, um, so this is before I went, uh, attended the merit school here. So when I was 17, um, I got accepted to the uh, Air Force Academy, received a nomination to go there. And so went there um, for my freshman and sophomore year and was an incredible experience. It was really intense. I mean, you guys know how many hours a semester like bogs you down. and. Um, I took 23 hours one semester and then 26 hours the following semester and they kind of load you up double majors and then a minor in Chinese and they make you do athletics. It was really uh, very intense, academically very intense, um, athletically very intense along all those lines. And, um, but it really opened my eyes up at a really young age to kind of what's possible and, and what you could handle workload wise and, and was uh, actually a really exciting time for me. I look back on that as two of the most formative years of my life. So uh, actually a question just going back, I mean, how many siblings do you have? So uh, I come from a family, there's five, five kids in the family, uh, oldest is a girl and then four boys and so I was the middle in that family. And so a question that kind of springs to mind is you had the same environment, the same family, the same upbringing and so on. Why were you the, the, uh, the entrepreneur? You have two brothers, obviously I know very well, very smart guys who also work at MX. Uh, just a general question, I'm not even sure why I'm asking this because we didn't agree to ask this question. But <laughs> why were you the entrepreneur? What influence made you the entrepreneur with multiple companies um, behind you and not necessarily your, your siblings? Yeah, um, and by the way, all questions, no questions are off limits even. You know. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, no, you ask whatever you want. <laughs> Um, so the whole reason why I did the format this way is to really kind of like make it relaxed and just really kind of have candid conversation. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've, uh, for one, I think that I have um, my brothers and, and my siblings are actually very driven. Um, uh, but there's different, I think that at a young age, early on, you kind of get this reinforced um, cycle of that you, you kind of get like a certain uh, uh, accomplishment at a young age and you kind of believe that it's now possible. And I think that's something that's really critical, which I love about the Entrepreneurship Center here, is trying to foster, you know, at a young age, which I know for you guys in the audience, you probably aren't realizing that college is a really young age, but trust me, as you get a little bit older, you'll realize that that's a really young age, um, is to foster that, that uh, cycle of trying something, realizing that, you know, just taking a step into the darkness can work out sometimes, right? And even when it doesn't work out and it kind of goes sideways on you, you can adjust, learn from it, and, and turn that lesson into the next iteration. And if you, if you really learn this kind of methodology of, of tightly coupled iterations, tightly um, uh, sequenced iterations, where whether or not you succeed or you, or you lose, you, you learn from that and you try again, you try again, it reinforces this kind of, I feel like almost high on um, that that next iteration, there's this hope of having this really big impact. And I think, and I'd be curious from your perspective, Don, like if, as you look at the MX culture, we have a lot of entrepreneurs in, you know, in, in the culture. So we have a lot of people who were CEOs prior to coming to MX and have been founders of companies prior to becoming an executive at MX. How important do you think that, that culture of that, that belief of tackling really hard things has, has played a role at MX? I mean, I'm, I'm very clear on why I personally joined MX. Um, having worked for some of the behemoth companies in the world with massive budgets and resources and so on. The culture, the people, and the platform. I think the platform, working for a company that's wonderful, but the platform is lukewarm or doesn't have the promise or the potential would be, I think, draining. But the culture and the people invigorate you. I'm certainly older than most of the people, if not everyone in this room. But even when you're working for a company like Intel, coming back and suddenly realizing that MX is people who don't know what no means, people who have a passion. You've mentioned the word passion several times and clearly you're a very passionate person. But having a company where all that comes together and you actually smile when you work, uh, drive into work, yeah. it's just amazingly invigorating. It helps you do more things. It helps you realize that there's always a yes to any question or problem. 
Uh, as an example, we're working on things such as, can you use payments data, predict health, and so on. And the number of people who line up and say, no, you can't do that because of HIPAA or regulations or something is amazing. And yet working in an environment like MX where the answer is yes, it's just how do you get there, I think is incredibly, uh, like I said, reinvigorating is the word. It just brings out the best in every employee who's there. Uh, and it's still very, very hard work, but it's fun, very, very hard work. So, so you actually moved from um, the Air Force into technology, and you actually formed a couple of companies around internet services, is that correct, here in Utah? Yeah, so uh, one question that comes up a lot um, that I'll get from uh, audiences like this is, um, how do you come up with the idea, or how does it originate, things like that. And in college, um, the, I mean, this you know, obviously dates me, but there, there's a time where getting internet <laughs> at... Like whether you lived in all these, like what are they, like Rain Tree Apartments and King Henry, those places still exist? You know, okay. <laughs> so um, those types of places, they didn't have internet. Like you moved in and it was just like, I don't know, like you'd ask them a call in and say, hey, how do we get internet? And they just kind of shrug their shoulders. And then there were a few places that they would charge like $30 per person living in a six, like so I think it was, I don't remember which one it was. There was one that I remember, they packed six students with like one shared bathroom into one apartment. And each one of the six students would have to pay individually 30 bucks for like 200K internet, like 256K internet. Do they really still do that? <laughs> oh. Okay, does it not like infuriate you? Yeah, all right. Come on, fight, fight. You know? So so for me, um, uh, we, we definitely did not want to just accept it. I was... I infuriated me. It was such a ripoff, especially because I, I had been um, kind of, you know, programming routers and messing with some stuff, and I had um, messed with, uh, you know, fractional T1s and things like that, and, um, and I knew that you could get what, how cheap bandwidth was at the data center. I'm like, man, at a data center, you can get huge amounts of bandwidth for nothing, and I was like, well, you could beam this stuff wirelessly, and they had okay technology for that back then, not as good as they do today. Um, and I'm talking like the directional beams, not the, the Wi-Fi we're all using in this room. Similar, similar technology, but, but, but different approach. Um, or you could actually rent conduit. We looked it up, and we're like, you could rent conduit from the city or from businesses, and you could run fiber lines underneath roads and stuff. And then you could run your own conduit once you actually got into the development to connect all the different buildings. And I was like, well, if we did that, and we looked at these buildings and we realized they had Cat5 cable going to the outside, we're like, well, Cat5 cable, if we split off their phone line separately and use two of the pairs, we could get about 10 megabits up and down to each individual unit. Um, and so as we looked at this, we're like, man, we could get screaming fast internet, dirt cheap to these, these, these what we call multi-dwelling units or multi-tenant units. And so we said, we should do this. And so as students, we just started running cable and tearing up sidewalks and stuff like that. And, um, and uh, one thing led to another, and we started like, getting more and more communities. And we'd sign like a whole community. So say you take like 200 condos and you have an HOA, we'd go sign that HOA and we'd bring internet to all, their entire um, condo association or, or townhouse association. And they also started doing the same for student housing. And the whole intent was for me, it started with me being furious. I'm like, I am not paying that much money for that kind of internet. And you can't even get, at the time they wouldn't even, like I asked for a static IP or a block of static IPs and they'd be like, I don't even know what that is. And I'd be like, ah, you know, so we, we, we wanted to build something that we wanted to use and that's the, the origin of, of, of that. And I did that um, while I was attending uh, Merritt School and then um, sold the business three months before I graduated, I think. Very interesting. So that ra ra raises a very interesting question, and I kind of didn't attend BYU myself, but I like the idea of why being the question why. Why did you get into financial services? Um, of all the industries you could have gone into, why financial services and why MX? And maybe we should play the video to... Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. So this video, a little bit of background. Um, and Don mentioned to me that he was going to show this slide in this video um, this morning. But uh, this video was actually made internally because it's a really big deal for us to have everyone in the company really constantly reminded of what we're doing and why we're going after what we're doing, uh, why we're tackling this problem. And the original people, when there was just 12, 20 people in the company, that was easy. We all knew. We were all hanging out at lunch and hanging out at dinner. We'd talk about what we were doing. But now as we're approaching 200 employees, it was important that we actually had a, a better way to communicate that meaning. And Don and his marketing team uh, put together, as we talked about the mission and vision of, of what our company's about, 
um, Don translated that into a video that I think describes pretty well what we care about. And we haven't checked the audio on this, so brace your ears just in case. So as you said, that was actually for internal use only, more to gather our thoughts, etc. But Ryan, the, the, the banking industry, the financial industry is the most lucrative industry on the planet by a million miles. Last quarter, they produced profits that were the record profits the industry has ever seen in its entire history. So everything's great in the financial industry, right? So within that YMX. So finan financially, things are, things are great. Um, but if you look, I mean, if, just, just for context, for people can understand, like, why, we, why do we attack the financial industry, attack the problems in the financial industry? I wouldn't say we're attacking the industry, we're helping the industry. But we're trying to attack these really significant problems in the industry. You have banks that profited $50 billion, one bank. There's 11, you know, 12-ish thousand of banks and credit unions in the US. Um, you've got one bank that made $50 billion not in revenue, in profit last year, $50 billion. That's like, that could swallow entire industries. There are entire industries that exist that their revenue doesn't equal the profit of one bank. The, they are, it is a ridiculously profitable industry, but it is behind, right? It's, it, 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 it's painfully and woefully behind. And when you look at some of these stats, and, and um, you know, this is one area where Don and I resonate so strongly because as, as we dig into this, it just, it, it, it should kind of light a fire under you. It should say, this is, this is unacceptable. I mean, you look at 
there's a th one that I focus on, the 35% of marriages uh, cite financial problems as the top source of stress. Number one source of stress in a marriage, right? I don't know how many of you are married yet. How many are married here yet, by the way? Okay. So there's a lot to be stressed about. You guys are probably still in the early honeymoon days. Thank goodness I still feel that way about my wife. I'm very happily married. Um, but, but there's a lot of stress. I and mean, with kids and with moving and with school and with all these other things, for finances to be the top stress of all the things you'd be stressed about in a marriage just shows how much finances can, can, can erode or, or attack the most important things in our lives to us. Um, but we look at all these other things. I mean, student debt. This kind of applies to everybody in this room, although BYU does a great job about not being an expensive school to go to. Um, but student debt now exceeds $1.3 trillion. It's mind-blowing. And by the way, that's with 3% interest rates. Some of us have lived in a period where interest rates rose to 17%. Yeah. So $1.3 trillion is definitely going to be a different number as and when interest rates rise. So I'm curious. There's a lot on here, and you guys are all reading them, but what's your, like, your number one on this page? For me, you know, it resonates with what I care about in life is about advancing mankind, having a better quality of life for people. And if you add value, you should get paid for that. So it's not about tearing down the banks or anything like this. It's about adding value and getting paid for it. I find the number of divorces, the number of people who are stressed out of the eyeballs to pay medical bills, which is the number one cause of personal financial bankruptcies, things like this, to be something that if we care about family life, which Utah and certainly the LDS Church is very focused on improving family life, you can't disassociate it from here. So for me, it's the divorce, it's the stress, it's the suicide rates of people who are so financially stressed they take their own lives. There's so much heavy stuff linked into the bad side of banking that I think it's incumbent upon us to surface the good side of banking, allow people to have good debt rather than bad debt. One thing that I also would add on here, um, all these stats impact me to a strong degree, but this 9%, so just to put that in context, for people understand what that one means. 9% of average household income is spent servicing debt, okay, debt interest. What that means is that's not that you're paying off debt. That means that you, that's just to pay the interest on the debt that you carry. So the average American is paying 9% of what they make is going to just pay interest. Not pay off debts, just pay interest on debts. That's average. So that means you have people way above that and you have some people below that. This is some terrifying kind of metrics. So, there's just a big problem in the industry. So for us, we felt really strongly that um, individuals don't have transparency into their finances. That the, the way that you can log into so many different things, whether it's you know, your Fitbit or this or that, and know exactly how many steps you're taking and exactly all those types of things, we don't have the equivalent um, mirror. We don't have the equ equivalent GPS in our finances. Great, got a question. Uh, go back. Which part was that? I can't go. Oh, this one here. Oh, so yeah. So what that means is um, every year um, banks are fined, right? So banks will do things that, um, now remember the banks only actually end up paying fines for things that work their way through the system. So the um, uh, regulatory agencies will say, you can't use these deceptive practices to hook people, or you can't change a rate on somebody on the fly, or you can't, things like that where they're not being transparent. Um, and so this is an example where a regulatory agency said, what you did was so bad, it, was, it, was, it wasn't in a gray area, it was over a line, that we're, we're stepping in and we're fining you. So that means that they paid $204 billion in penalties. Since 2008. Since it 2008. also includes things that we just don't believe should happen in a civilized society, for example, if your bank said, oh, we have a policy of not lending to Mormons, you'd be outraged. Banks today still say, we won't lend to black people because they're in a demographic area that's poverty, we probably won't get paid. There are some atrocious behaviors that go on. And yeah, and there, there's ways that they'll try to like, so these regulatory agencies, which too much regulation is bad, but, but regula re regulation's needed. I mean, even Jamie Dimon, CEO of Chase has said, regulators serve a purpose, but he would also agree that you don't want too much of it, right? But there's a balance, but there are, um, with regulation, there are times that <coughs> the banks will try to skirt issues where they'll say, well, we didn't discriminate, we did it by zip code. But they knew in certain zip codes that there were certain um, things that negatively impacted consumers. And so with that much money on the line, if you look at how much the banks are making, there's a huge incentive to do everything from bundle up collateral collateralized debt obligations and mortgage-backed securities and sell them as AAA when they're really not and all these types of things that can occur that banks will try to get away with if left to their own devices. And so with our current banking system where it's actually, for the most part, you know, it's working in certain regards, it's failing enough that there's 
there's penalties that can add up to that amount. It's just a, it's a dizzying amount of money. So that's what it means. Good question. And I, I kind of thought the question why? Why the financial industry? It tees up other industries like the auto industry and so on. And I just thought it'd be interesting for people from an entrepreneur's point of view to kind of contrast the financial industry. We we're pretty negative there, although obviously the industry does do a lot of good. It helps businesses grow and so on. This is just the bad behavior portion of it. And so, again, we believe you can have your cake and eat it. But it's kind of interesting that as consumers, everyone, we spoke about how many people are married, how many people, you know, may be struggling with debt at some stage. Chances are nearly everyone will have some problem or other unless you're really very fortunate. But how does that contrast with, say, the auto industry? Well, so for us, when we, we use this analogy a lot, but, um, and I mean, to, to, get, to, to talk about the financial industry for one second longer before we jump to this analogy, um, there, the financial industry, all, although it's getting $204 billion in fines over those years, um, there's a lot going wrong. And, and, um, but the financial industry is, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like your circulatory system. I mean, you, you cut off the circulation of blood and oxygen, I mean, like, or, or the flow of money in, a, in, a, in a, 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 a country in the world, and things go sideways really quickly. So the same way that I look at things like the invention of the microprocessor and Intel doing the incredible job that they did to be able to rapidly, you know, you, uh, you know Moore's Law, rapidly innovate and improve microprocessors, provided a fabric, a foundation that the rest of the world got to innovate on top of. And Apple and Samsung, Apple kicking it off, but Samsung uh, building these great mobile devices that are these little mini supercomputers provided a platform for app stores and things like that. And um, you look at these, these key innovations that they're great innovations in and of themselves, but what's literally, and it's not even hyperbole to say a thousand times, 10,000 times or greater, a bigger impact is what's built on top of these platforms. The financial industry is a platform. It powers everything. If you can't get a small business loan, if you can't get a student loan, if you can't be able to leverage credit for credit cards, you look at the number of businesses that couldn't have been built if we don't have a robust, uh, robust financial system. And so we need a financial system to, to, to be strong and we need it to be transparent because we need to know where we stand in that. We need to know, are we able to get credit? Can we get loans? Can we build our business? Things like that. And so we all benefit from a very strong financial system. So. So it's just key to understand the good that it does with the, the, the deficits that it has. So let's talk about the deficits for a second. If I look at the auto industry, I am a lover of cars. I'm excited, excited for autonomous cars as well, but I will always get a good you know, car out on the road and, 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 and race um, on whatever roads they will continue allow, to allow us to drive on as autonomous vehicles become the dominant uh, 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 factor, the dominant uh, form factor. But um, in the auto industry, so cars work great. They're, they're really reliable, they're, they're safe, they've got these great airbags and all that, so what's wrong with cars? What the auto industry did that I was very impressed with is they realized, look, we've got people who, who are just busy, they're exhausted, so they're, they're driving, they are distracted by a work text, they're distracted by a work phone call, they're distracted by the chaos of stop and go traffic on the freeway, or they're distracted by a crying child in the background who's hitting another child in the, in the back seat. And as they turn around to deal with all this life chaos and their overwhelm, that car could be driving 80 miles an hour to the back of a semi-truck. Or it could be swerving into a lane where an 18-wheeler's tires are about to chew through the front of that car, causing it to spin out of control or flip. This is the reality of the, the freeway. So what did the auto industry do? The auto industry didn't say, who cares, you know, tough, you know, cars are good enough, you'll still buy it. Um, it's, it was competitive enough, which is critical in all industries, for the auditors to say, well, we could design a system. We could actually create, we could leverage you know, these different sensors and these different abilities to say that you're drifting out of your lane or to not just alert you, beep at you, if you're driving into the back of a semi-truck at 80 miles an hour as you're turning around to deal with a child in the back seat, but it will literally break for you if it realizes that you don't have a chance of stopping in time and it will even guide it to a safe stop. So why don't we have that in the financial industry? So when I've met with, I've met with the CEOs of the largest banks in, in the U.S. and some in the world, and when I sit down with them and we talk about, you know, what they're trying to do, they say, well, we're all about customer service. We're all about taking care of our end users. And I'm like, well, the auto industry, well, you know, the, new, the newest cars won't let you drive into the back of a semi-truck at 80 miles an hour, but you're letting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students drive their financial lives into the back of a semi-truck at 100 miles an hour where they don't have a snowball's chance and whatever of being able to escape that student debt, right? So you gotta get real, you either gotta admit you don't really care about your customers or you have completely inadequate systems. 
And if you don't have an ability to look at, have a user look at their full financial life and know, am I okay? Am I gonna be able to make it through the next year, two years, five years, 20 years? Can I retire? Can I buy the things that I need to buy? If they can't really plan their life through your, their interaction with you, then you're not really their primary financial institution. You're not really taking care of them. Just admit you don't, and then let someone else step in and take care of them. And the reaction from these, these CEOs, which, is, which gives me hope, is they say, but we want to be, but we can't. We're dealing with regulation and compliance. We don't have the technological prowess to build that, and we're like, we do. So let us build this technology and let us integrate these early warning systems into your financial institution so that you can take care of your users. And one other thing that I'll speak about along those lines that I think is powerful is we don't, the banks don't sell the software to the users. We've told them, you buy it from us, but you provide it to your end users for free, and you make money off the loyalty. Take good care of your customers, they'll do more business with you, but we don't want you charging your end users, your banking and your credit union customers. We want you to take good care of your customers because it's good business the way that Google tries to take care of its searchers and Amazon tries to take care of its purchasers. So, you have a question there? Yeah, so I was coming in and I, I heard an apology commercial from Wells Fargo Bank. Yeah. And my question is, um, you know, Wells Fargo Bank is one of the largest banks in the United States. They have these early warning signs. Yep. Visualize it very beautifully and clearly. How much um, control do you ensure that So it's a really good question. So the question was, how do you make sure that you don't misuse this data uh, to do anything that might be abusive practice, right? Um, and your comment was to upsell the customer. Well, the answer is, you know, certain upsell is, is really negative, but other upsell is wonderful. If you realize that somebody um, was, had a 0% interest rate on, a, on like a, 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 a hook a, a, a rate, a teaser rate of 0%, but then they pay just one day late, and they didn't realize that they paid one day late, and they didn't realize if they paid one day late that it would jump to 28%. Well, the bank will mail them a little envelope that three months later, they'll get around to opening that'll say, hey, you thought that that $30,000 you, you transferred over as part of your student debt that you guys are all racking up to some degree, right? Um, no? No one's doing it? No, racking up a little bit of debt? No? <laughs> so, um, but, but that, that debt you're racking up, when you transfer that 30,000 over, it was great at 0%, but as soon as it bounced to 28, you're now paying hundreds of dollars of interest every month that you maybe can't even afford, but you're not aware of it. So if that card gets aggregated in and bank B sees that that user is being abused, they're able to say, hey, we just noticed because we're, we're helping guard your finances for you. We noticed this rate just jumped and we'd offer you a rate of this. So selling somebody over to a more meaningful product is helpful. Um, but, but the goal, what we always say to the banks is, um, there are two forces that are driving uh, change across like the entire world, and they're, in my opinion, two major ones. And these are like the these are the deep ocean currents. These are not the little waves at the top. These are not like little localized climate. This is like deep currents. These deep currents are increased choice and decreased switching cost. So increased choice and decreased switching cost completely is revolu 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 is revolutionizing the world, but revolutionize the newer industry. So take a new industry that was born in increased choice and decreased switching cost. You have Google, so search engines. So Google said, well, I've got all this search data. I could use this in all these negative ways. Now, they were tiny. You had an overture, which was massive. Overture would leverage the fact that you had searched through them to give you irrelevant ad content. Upsell to a, a, an account you don't need would be the equivalent of a bank. Um, and at first, Overture, again, was the 800-pound gorilla. It was massive compared to Google. But Google bet that because users could switch so easily and because switching cost was so, was so low, that if they, made, if they focused on a better experience that really served the user, that over time, and even not too much time, more and more users would flood to their search engine and would abandon Overture. So even though Overture would make more money for a short period of time, in the long run, Overture's business model would literally erode and Google would become dominant. Now, that's, what, that's when it's a new industry. You see Amazon, right? And I, I'm a fan of Amazon. Um, they're not perfect, just like Google's not perfect, but I look at how Amazon makes sure that I have incredible choice. If they don't supply it, they'll let me link to another site and they'll even handle the buying of it even though it doesn't go directly through them. And if I have any issues, they'll help me return it and they, can do, they do the frustration-free packaging. I don't know who uses frustration-free packaging. It's awesome. Um, and so there's all these just great benefits of, of Amazon that are built in. And, and just recently, this last week, Amazon went after the fake reviewers. So anyone who's writing a fake review on their site, they went after them aggressively. Well, they're doing that for me. 
because they don't want me to have a fake review. They want to know that I'm looking at real reviews of people who really bought the product, and, and, and I just love that, right? So now they're disrupting the normal retail, right? So what we say to banks is this is the new normal. Now, as regulation protects certain industries more than those, like there was no regulation in search. There was very little regulation around retail, right? But we're watching that even regulated industries can't hold back the tsunami of these two forces. If you've got choice and it's low switching cost, regulation is gonna fail against that wave. So let's take one that was a slightly regulated industry. Let's take um, uh, taxis. Taxis are regulated, very regulated. There's all sorts of laws around it, but you cannot stop the wave of Uber or Lyft or whatever, you know, any of those services. The convenience of just opening my phone and hitting I want a ride and I can see exactly how far away they are. If that you know, taxi abandons me or doesn't come pick me up, I can actually rate that person lower. And I, I have all this information at my fingertips and I don't have to swipe cards or do all that junk because I'm hopping in and out of a cab at New York or wherever I might be. And now, I, I mean, I used to not use, only use Uber when I go to like San Francisco and New York and other cities. Now I use it all the time when I'm here at Salt Lake. I mean, it's great in Utah. Uber's really built itself out here. Um, so that regulation couldn't hold. But there's these two industries that are kind of the holdouts are financial and medical, and they're just super regulated for good reason. They're super regulated. But at the end of the day, the, the banks that are the good actors and the, the healthcare companies that are the good actors are going to win. So what we're trying to do is find the banks that are the most progressive, which we now have 1,100 banks on our platform, 1,100 plus banks and credit unions on our platform. We're finding the ones that are saying, we don't want to wait for regulation to come in and make us be better actors. We want to be better actors today. And we know we're gonna be more profitable by being better actors today, but we don't have the technology for it. And we say, we can integrate with your current systems and provide that technology. So the idea that they would use it for abusive practices would, would be counterintuitive to the understanding of this, this deep change. And we talk, when we meet with banks, we talk a lot with this, the, the C-level of that bank about the reasons why this is becoming critical, not just here's cool, net, cool technology and cool data, have at it. Great, great question. So the question was, why go to the banks? Why not go to the individual? Um, and the answer is that, um, so uh, humans are really interesting, right? And so um, on something that they're very used to, especially something like finances or health, there is, if you're switching search engines or you're switching um, uh, where you might buy your next product or your next book, um, there's not much anxiety around switching. When you're talking about who you're gonna do your mortgage through, and when you're talking about who you're gonna do your auto loan through, or who you're gonna do your 401k or your savings through, people are becoming, the younger generations, are more open to trying new stuff. But overall, even the younger generations, they would prefer a large dominant percentage, is 70, 80%, I don't know the exact percent, prefer to get these services still through their bank, right? They just want their banks to be good actors. Their banks and credit unions. We service a ton of credit unions. So credit unions and banks, I'm treating them kind of equally. So, um, so the answer is, if they already know how to handle regulation, if they already know how to do, because this industry has to be regulated. It's just, I mean, you don't want banks un, and credit unions unregulated. So since it has to be regulated, they're already really good at that standpoint. Let's let them keep handling all of that regulation, but let's empower them with technology and we can hit scale much faster. So you look at these startups and they're like, oh, we hit a million users, or we hit five, two million or five million users or 10 million users. Well, we sign one bank and that could be a million, five million, 10 million, 30 million users, right? So it's much more efficient to reach a larger group of people by going through the banks and their existing customers, a large number of which would have high friction to leave. Now we power FinTech companies as well, and we help FinTech companies even work and integrate with banks to certain degrees, and that's gonna be more and more of what we're doing in the future. But, um, but we found that we wanted to partner with the banks because of the, re the regulated nature of the industry. Yeah, so uh, good question. So it, 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 it would definitely is something that separates us from Mint. I mean, I look at Mint, and Mint, um, you know, they max out, I think, about 12 million, maybe 15 million users if you stretch. Probably a small fraction of those are really, truly active. Um, that's smaller than one large bank on our platform. So for us, we weren't interested in just building a company that could be flipped really quickly and make a few hundred million dollars. That, that wasn't in exciting to us. We were interesting in revolutionizing an industry. And so to do that at scale, um, we couldn't take that mint path. The world wasn't quite ready for a direct mint path, um, but we could do it through the banks and, and we could be a friend to the bank. We could, be, we could empower that bank. Um, 
you know, one thing that's interesting, if you look at, like, I think Mint sold for about 185 million, just, I'm, I'm only using the sale as a, as a qualification of size or impact, but you look at companies like CheckFree, so the founder of CheckFree um, sits on our board, and um, uh, Don worked with him at Fiserv, um, but he sold his company for, um, he was the founder, he only raised three million in venture capital, and he built it to four and a half billion dollars, and sold it for four and a half billion. So you got 185 million, seems impressive, you got four and a half billion. Well, he went through the banks. He went through the banking industry and, and didn't go direct and meant went direct. Now they're slightly different business models, right? But it still shows the delta of the, the scale and impact you can achieve by going through the banks. Really good question. Got a question in the back? That's a great question. Um, so we slide up. Yeah, do you want to bring that up? <clears throat> well, or did you want to? We've only got about three minutes. I want to be respectful of people's time, so we've rapidly consumed our time. But are we three minutes to the very end? Yeah. Oh wow. And then there's questions. Q and A up at seven ten afterwards. Perhaps. Oh, we changed rooms. Okay, I didn't know we changed rooms. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you a quick answer on that. So I, I used to program internet routers. We use the same approach for internet routing as we did for bank data. So I patented the process of aggregate, aggregation routing. So the, the uh, aggregation is the aggregation or the harvesting or collecting of this disparate data and then being able to collect that in, into a single source. And so that's how we do it. And so we have the world industry leading methods of doing that and uh, it enables us to do it to a much higher success rate than anything else that's been out there before. Can I, I'd love for you to speak a little bit to this. This is okay. I mean, I, I would suggest, in terms of uh, actually getting a feel about the entrepreneurship, there's a couple of things I would like you to touch on quickly, okay. actually, personally. But um, one of them is obviously on the user experience. We will talk about this real quick. But the user experience, and then something that was really interesting is why not go after the big guys versus the little guys as part of your business strategy, which I just thought might be an interesting. Oh, the whale side, yeah. Um, in terms of here, let me just go over this real quick, and sure. then I'll go hit some buttons on there so you can talk over the bubble budgets, perhaps. Great. On here, basically, we basically, uh, just to summarize what you've heard so far, the actual strategy of the company is to make, or the, the vision of the company, rather, is to make finances as they should be. Finances are essential, they're important, um, and there's a lot right with them, and we intend to make them even better and more valuable for uh, advancing mankind. The mission of it is to uh, empower the world to become financially strong, and financially strong consumers is good for the individual, it's good for the community, it's good for uh, democracy, quite frankly, and so on. So there's just so many reasons why boring old financial system is so important to us, not just to buy that new car, but to actually improve the world we live on, and that should be an important deal for everyone on there. And the values, I think, are definitely worth a, a future time, but um, would you mind if I just actually went over and then you could talk over the two, the two points that I think would be good to leave this audience with? One is the actual customer experience, which when you actually look at the, the question about Mint and others, the usability of any kind of solution, I think, is huge. And if you don't mind talking about this, Ryan, whoops. I'll just make sure that we skip over to the right area on here. So these so, are the ones on the budgets. Yeah. yeah, I'll touch on this quickly. So what you'll see here, and this is a quick exercise, you've got account number one and account number two. These two people set the exact same budgets. So they had the same desire to have the same spending, but they had different transactions, so they spent differently. Which one of these people is in serious trouble and which one of these people is pretty much doing fine? Okay, I'm getting different answers. Get some people saying right. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a, a more modern interface, interface that we patented that shows the two side by side and how quickly are you able to tell which one's on and which one's off. The, we have a serious design issue in finances where we make things like spreadsheets and things complicated that they don't need to be. And we have multiple interfaces that we've patented at MX that we help banks describe in easy to consume ways that a five-year-old can look at this. I show this to a five-year-old and they say, which one's better? And they immediately point to which one's better. And we want to make our experiences like that. And they're also playful. So if you look at you know this next one, we just made them where you move them around and click on them, you, dot, you can drill into them and they expand and they show you all the transactions inside and you can dial them up or dial them down, and it provides a really easy way for your finances to not seem like you need an accounting degree for you to understand where you are, so. Okay, the second one, just to close on here, was um, I know being British, when I came over there, you said, I mean, for me, strategy is the allocation of scarce resources, and you were very clear as that we don't want to do business with whales. Yeah. And so I got, I got confused on this. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't that whales. 
It was a different whale. So, and I'll make this quick, because I know you guys have got to move on to your next class. The bottom line is, in entrepreneurship for us, we, knew, we have to understand, you want to be aggressive in what you want to tackle, but you have to understand your limitations. So we knew day one that we couldn't close Chase and Wells Fargo and the big guys right out of the gate. So we focused on helping the smallest institutions first, and then worked our way up to medium size and slightly larger, all the way up to the big ones. So that's just a perspective that I think is really helpful for entrepreneurship.